I am very, very, very uh, happy to be able to present to you uh, our second speaker for today, um, and that is Mr. Simon Kfela, uh, who Hello, is... Everyone. <laughs> He's smiling and waving beautifully at you already. Simon is based in Cambridge, but this is not, I know now, not his place of origin. He'll tell you more about it, I'm sure. Um, Simon specializes in elocution and spoken English, uh, not just for uh, teaching purposes, so to speak, not in the academic world only, but also in the world of executives, the business world. Um, and again, I know that he will be telling you more about it in his session. Um, he is a regular speaker at various sorts of, uh, of uh, training events. And interestingly for our little EFL world, um, he was selected back in 2019 to be a speaker for the special interest group showcase at the global IATFO conference. So uh, he is very well familiar with the concerns of uh, 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 teachers of English, but he also has something very, very special to add. And that is the fact that he is a professional opera singer himself. And what you are about to experience is something truly unique, and that is a way to combine insights from music, from the world of singing, from the world of opera, and those of uh, uh, professional coaching people in the domain of English pronunciation. So uh, uh, without any further ado, uh, Mr. Simon Kfele, the floor is yours, and uh, I am all ears because I know <laughs> what is going to happen, but uh, since you haven't seen it yet, I envy you because you have all the fun <laughs> awaiting you in just <laughs> just a, a little while. Uh, I will disappear, but I might be back, Simon. I yes, I back. hope so, because I need you for the last section of my talk. Um, so, <laughs> so I'll see you in a little bit, uh, Grzegorz. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone, uh, wherever you may be. It's, it's delightful to... Um, to see that uh, there's so, such a following for my for my talk and that so many people are, are attending today. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. I hope this will be a, a useful session to you all. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Macmillan Education for their invitation. I think this idea of hosting a global festival in a time where connection between humans is all the more important because of COVID-19. I think it's fantastic that people are putting energy into doing these sorts of events. So thank you so much for putting this together. So uh, my name is Simo Kvelaya. I'm an accent management coach, uh, pronunciation specialist, you could call it that. Uh, but I also happen to be a professional opera singer. And my talk today is dedicated to the uncovering of the connective tissue that exists between uh, two worlds that are seemingly unrelated, that of music and that of uh, linguistics and language and, and, and the world of uh, EFL. Um, and I'm ho also hoping to show you how I use the techniques of a singer uh, and how I leverage them to improve and help my clients improve with clarity and confidence in English. Um, so just a, a few bits of admin before we start. So if there are any questions, my understanding is that you can type them into the chat box and then they'll be collected by someone and then put to me at the end of the session. Uh, so I look forward uh, to your questions at the end. Um, also, keep that chat box handy because I might call upon you once in a while uh, if uh, uh, to keep things interactive a little bit. I like to keep an element of to and fro between uh, the people I work with and myself, and hopefully we can try and use some of it, albeit digitally for today. Um, so uh, I'd like, first of all, to tell you what my objectives are for today. Um, so I want to achieve three things. Um, first of all, I'd like to give you an insight into my journey um, because I think it's relevant to the topic today. Um, me starting as a, music as a musician and opera singer and then fanning into the field of linguistics and language. So I think that journey is relevant um, to the whole thing, the whole approach really. In a second, uh, place, I'd like to introduce you to the cornerstones of my approach. So what are the concepts that underpin everything that I do with my clients, students, the people I work with in general? And finally, we're going to bring uh, Grzegorz back into the, uh, the digital room, and we're going to do a few demonstrations on how exactly I use my operatic training to help clients with clarity and confidence in English in 
spoken performance skills at large, all right? So um, we're gonna start by uh, me doing what every opera singer loves to do, which is to talk about themselves. Um, and so I'm just gonna give you a, a quick overview of who I am as a person. So um, you should know from the offset that uh, my mother tongue is French. Up until the age of 27, I considered myself to be a learner of English. I had learned English quite early on as a child, but I wasn't fully operational, let's say, in English until the age of 27. Um, I originally trained as an actor and a professional opera singer in Canada, and then I made my way to the UK in 2010 to do my master's at the, at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama in London. And um, I was lucky enough to get started. I was lucky enough to get a few gigs, to get an agent, and uh, to start being active in this landscape uh, as a young singer. Um, and the, the early career of a young singer is very diversified. You have to do lots of things to um, to put yourself out there. You have to do concert work, which I love doing. You have to do oratorio work, which is sacred music that's generally performed alongside a choir. Um, and But most of all, I love doing opera. Um, why? Well, because there's a sense of collegiality, of, 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 uh, of common understanding when you rehearse together and you try to put on uh, these magical works that we, that we, that we have in the, in the repertoire. Um, and I thought I'd finish this brief introduction of myself by talking about two key moments of my operatic life. Uh, the first one is uh, the image that's at the bottom central uh, section of your slide. And uh, that's a short selfie that I took a few minutes before uh, opening night of uh, Mahler's Songs of the Earth. And I was at the London Coliseum at that time, and I was performing alongside the, the cast and the company of the English National Ballet. So I was collaborating with dancers on that, uh, on that occasion, which was wonderful. On the bottom left section, you have my last opera uh, that I performed in, uh, which was a contemporary opera by English composer Jonathan Dove called Mansfield Park. You might know the, the name. Yes, it's based on the Jane Austen uh, book of the same name. Um, and that was just before COVID hit. Um, so, yeah, I've been lucky enough to have a wonderful, vibrant, operatic life. But I've always been on the lookout for other things. I've always tried to heed the advice of the wise old Spartacus in the 1960s Stanley Kubrick film where, you know, he's freed the slaves and he's trying to kind of build the just city and he's asking everyone to contribute in their very own way. And then there's a scene where he comes upon a youth, a young man, and he says, you there, what work do you do? And then very pridefully, the young man says, well, I'm a singer of songs. And then there's a bit of a pause and then, you know, Kirk Douglas replies, well, yeah, but what else do you do? Um, and that always stuck with me, this idea of always being on the lookout for ways with which I can recycle my skill set in some way, to be open to other avenues of inquiry and research and uh, furthering myself uh, and hopefully helping others in the in the meantime. Round about the same time, I encountered the work of this man. Now, I'm gonna give you guys 10 seconds. I'd like for you guys to guess who that person is. You've got 10 seconds, off you go. Ah, there you go, that wasn't, fun. That wasn't um, uh, long. We have Aziza, who accurately found that this was Leonard Bernstein, absolutely. Leonard Bernstein was an American Jewish uh, composer. Uh, he's famously known for having written West Side Story. Uh, but additionally to that, he was also a great communicator around the topic of language, a great educator of music in America, and um, also a great artist in himself in his own right. Um, he recorded some of the most major works in classical music from Beethoven to Mozart to Wagner to, to Brahms. Um, and but I, I didn't encounter him through his music at first. I encountered him through a series of lectures that he gave uh, for Harvard University in the 1970s. By the way, they're all available on YouTube, uh, and the series is called The Unanswered Question. In that series of lectures that spans seven hours, um, Bernstein created a web of connective tissue between music and language, and I felt that that was so interesting to me. Um, and he even structured the shape of his, um, of the arc of his lectures using the building blocks of language themselves. So the first few lectures were focusing on phonetics, how we in music, we have tones and utterances and dynamic inflections that we use to produce them. And in some way, these are our vowels, our consonants. 
we string these utterances together to f create or form rhythmic motifs, melodies, late motifs, if you're a fan of Wagner's music, um, and we use them to form phrases, all right? And finally, we share the exact same goal as language, which is ultimately the expression of complex sensations, situations, emotions, thoughts. Um, so this affiliation between music and language was so apparent to me that I, I kept on thinking about this process. Well, and, and, and I did what every you know, graduate student worth his salt would do, which is to go to Wikipedia for a definition. Um, and I got a definition for the art form I'd been practicing for so long and never considered it in that way. Um, what is singing? Well, singing is a, just an augmented version of speech. It's a turbocharged version of, version of speech that we use to produce music. All right, so I'm proficient at augmented speech, heightened speech. Um, and so I tried to push that thinking further. Well, what about opera singing? Because it's such a unique skill set, isn't it? And I tried to boil it down to the essentials. What are opera singers good at? Well, a few things. We're very good at breath control. By that, I mean that we understand the musculature around the diaphragm uh, as a tool to allow us to generate a lot of airflow when we sing. We take that airflow and we overlay it with t tone or voice, and that's what we use to sing. So this uh, intricate control of our diaphragm and the surrounding muscles around it helps us to manage breath however we like. The second thing we're good at is targeting vowels. Um, you'll say, well, yeah, but vowels, it's easy, right? Not necessarily. Depending on the type of music we're singing, the type of fragment and the, uh, the volume we're singing it at, or the type of pitch that we're singing it at, um, we're going to try and find intricate variations on vowel sounds depending on what we're singing. I'll give you an example. When I sing the vowel A, ah, that A ah will have a different color if it's at the bottom of my range, if it's in the middle of my range, or it's at, if it's at the top of my range. Um, Generally, it'll be broad at the bottom, it'll narrow in as I reach the upper middle voice, and fan out again back to this pure A uh, as, I, as I rise into, uh, into my top register. I'll give you an example, uh, and hopefully you'll see that um, singing is about gradients of vowels um, throughout the register of a singer. So, broad at the bottom, narrow in the middle, and broad at the top again. Let's have it. Oh! So I find myself using different shades of ah to fit the place that I'm using it in my voice, okay? So, and that for singers, it's our bread and butter. It's this daily Sudoku of figuring out what vowel should I use for that uh, section of the piece or for that vowel here or for that word here. The composer is asking me to do that. What if that vowel was more suitable to that objective? We're great targeters and users of vowels. The next thing that we do really well is we project. Uh, if you enter in an opera rehearsal room at some point, if you're lucky enough to, to experience that, what you'll hear a lot is text, text, text. We're forced, because of the nature of our craft, to project our voice very far and to make sure that text is audible. Um, and there are several reasons for this. Very often, the size of the audience. Uh, we perform in audience sizes that uh, can be, um, that can go well beyond a 1,000 people. Uh, that is done without the use of microphones. And um, additionally, uh, on top of that, we're doing it over the, the sound of an orchestra that can be north of 80 musicians, depending on the repertoire that you're doing. So we're great at projecting and energizing consonant sounds as part of our work. The last two are more about the artistry of the singer, but I think they're relevant as well to our users of language. We are very creative in the way we use the voice in opera. Um, there's a beautiful Italian expression, I don't know if some of you are Italian, um, which is prima la voce. It translates to first the voice. Now, that does, this doesn't mean that um, pronunciation and enunciation is put aside for the benefit of the vowels. It just means first act with your voice. So that means that we need to use both vowels and consonants as a communicative medium to infuse ideas and emotions and subtext and, and highlight keywords and so on. 
And we'll get back to that in a second. Finally, we're also storytellers. An opera singer is also an actor. We're still on stage telling a story with fellow colleagues. We each have our character and we are trying to keep people interested in the development of the plot of the story. So we're storytellers as well, okay? Um, yeah, I forgot to mention, we're also very good at, at, at being divas, uh, but that's uh, not me, it's uh, generally my colleagues, the Sopranos in general. Um, so, this is the skill set that we have, breath control, vowels, enunciation, creativity, and the use of our voices. So I've tried to think of, um, ways with which I, re I could recycle that skill set. And gradually it became clear that I wanted to help people that struggle with enunciation, with clarity, with pronunciation um, in the corporate world, in the world of academia, for example. So I became an accent management coach, a pronunciation specialist uh, as a result of that. Um, so I had an issue though when I started because the word accent um, is problematic. We live in a time where uh, notions of inclusion, diversity, are just rightfully changing the way we think about society, about the place of people within it, and ultimately how we think about language and the words that we use. And to me, the word accent always brings about other vocabulary pinging in our head as we think about this. Words like provenance, immigration, migration, the concept of foreignness, being a foreigner, and also terms that are even more contentious, like native, non-native, which are now being reconsidered um, uh, in their use. So um, I decided to create two core values that would act as the lenses through which all of my tuition would be delivered going forward. The first of all, uh, the first one is the complete and utter respect for someone's cultural and linguistic heritage. It seems easy to say, but for me, it manifests in, a, in an attitude to teaching uh, that is very important to me. I'm not trying in the work I do to, to, to wedge out a section of who you are as a person. No, I'm in an addition mindset. I'm always trying to give more tools so that you feel empowered to use that skill set in however direction, in whatever direction you wish. Um, does that make sense? Great. Um, the second one was to aim for a simple thing, clarity and confidence, all right? By that, what do I mean? Well, I don't need you to sound British. I don't want you to sound American. I want you to sound like you, all right? I have people that leave my studio, they're content with my services, um, and, and they know they have an accent. I know they still have an accent. However, they feel like I've given them a lot of tools to prop themselves up, to anchor themselves into language, and to feel like they can go on with their lives in English. They now feel that their linguistic skills are on a par with all the other skills that they have at their, uh, in life. Um, and, and so I think it's worth reiterating that this kind of all condenses into a, a key why for me. Um, and that is uh, the fact that pronunciation should be in the service of communication. Diction and enunciation shouldn't be an end goal in itself, all right? We're always in the service of, effecting, uh, of, of, of effective communication. And that's a problem because words like enunciation and elocution and diction, especially in English, have such a, a heavy weighted past, right? As soon as you say English diction, we immediately think about My Fair Lady, The Rain in Spain, bit, uh, Betty's Bits of Bitter Butter and, and that sort of thing. Um, and to me, it's a perspective that is not uh, accurate for the world we live in now. Um, I'm not trying to put a facade on the way you use English. I'm not trying uh, f to polish a diamond in the rut, no. Um, if I'm to use a motoring analogy, I'm trying to extract as much horsepower out of that V8 engine that's inside you, rather than to polish the body of the car or to wax it forever. It's not about the facade, it's about meaningful internal changes that build clarity and confidence over time, okay? Um, and so I can't tell you how refreshing it was to eventually be asked to work with um, a group of people that, uh, for whom this notion of pronunciation for 
effect or for the prettiness of it is completely irrelevant. Over the past few years, I've been lucky enough to work with air traffic controllers. Um, I don't know if you know any air traffic controllers or, you, or you've encountered people like that, but they're fantastic individuals. They're people that have mostly a scientific background. So they're very proficient in mathematics, physics, engineering. They're also very often plane pilots themselves, um, but they also have to be highly effective communicators. And they do that in a landscape that's really, really difficult to manage. They have to deal with intricate technical jargon all the time. They are experiencing stress levels that are high constantly. Needless to say that they also live in an environment where mistakes are very costly. So the cost of making mistakes is very, very high. And also they're always pressured by time, all right? And these are three things that, um, I try to warn my students against when I work um, in, in, in a classroom. I say, try and relax. It's okay if you make a mistake. Take your time, all right? And now with them, they can't really implement that. Um, they have a daily and constant use of English as a key fail-safe to accident prevention. And this, this concept harks back to something that's much older. And that's the concept of lingua franca. Uh, most of you have probably come across this concept. Um, but a lingua franca in the air traffic industry would be to uh, be a French air traffic controller communicating in English with a Chinese pilot, all right? It's a communicative medium of choice that is chosen among speakers of different languages, okay? I've put here the um, the image of Marco Polo arriving in front of the great Khan for the first time. God knows what language they were speaking at the time, but they had to find a medium of choice among the two of them to be able to communicate for the first time and create this bridge between East and West. Um, and we've had different lingua francas throughout history. We've had Greek and Latin uh, in antiquity. And then in the Middle Ages, we had um, Arabic for the Islamic world, we had classical Chinese in the Far East, and we also had French in Europe as the main language of diplomacy. Since the Industrial Revolution, um, English has taken that spot of the world's lingua franca, all the way through to 1944, where suddenly the uh, aviation industry decided to use English as their language of choice for uh, uh, keeping our airspaces safe. That is the choice of a true lingua franca uh, as far as um, this concept is concerned, all right? English was chosen as the lingua franca of the sky to make sure that we're all safe when we fly. So this concept of lingua franca was also addressed by linguists. Uh, I don't know if some of you are familiar with the work of Jennifer Jenkins. Uh, she's a, a modern language and linguistic specialist at uh, Southampton University. And she studied the phonology of English, but in the context of it being a, a, an international language of communication. And she came up with this concept, which is called lingua franca core, where she evaluates the core aspect of pronunciation um, and, and, and uh, sorry, the, the core aspects of, of pronunciation and how that establishes the bedrock of intelligibility, being clear in, and intelligible in English. Um, and, and she boiled it down to something very, very simple. If you want to be clear in English, you need to do four things. And that's the results that she found. You need to be reliably using consonants in a clear way. That's the first thing. Second of all, you need to preserve what we call consonant clusters. We'll have a look at those at some point. You need to be very accurate in your delivery of vowel length. As you all know, English is a language that has short sounds, and long sounds, and we need to be able to differentiate the two together. Finally, we also have to be reliable in our placement of the nuclear stress, all right? How we are able to target the right syllable within words and, and, and lean on them efficiently to make them audible. And that provides us with a really, really cool template going forward because we can build a strategy on this. I don't know if some of you are familiar with the Pareto Principle, Someone says yes, lovely. Um, so the Pareto Principle suggests that 
in order to leverage success on a work product, we need to focus on a few vital, uh, vit vital tasks for 20% of the time. That 20% of the time focus on these vital tasks will generate 80% of the results of a work outcome. So now our 20% are the four areas of Jennifer's Lingua Franca. And we're going to focus on these areas to generate meaningful progress uh, as far as our students' use of English and especially their clarity in English is concerned. Yeah, um, and so now I'd like to invite uh, Grzegorz back to the table um, for this last section of the talk. Um, we're going to try and cover these four areas of focus that have been highlighted by uh, Jennifer Jenkins, uh, but I'm going to put my singer's twist on them, and hopefully you'll be finding some interesting tools that you can implement in your own classrooms uh, wherever you may be. Now, do I have uh, Grzegorz available somewhere? You do indeed. <laughs> Hello, Grzegorz. Well, I've logged myself on. Can you hear me? Can you see him. me? Uh-oh. Ah, okay. I think he's joining. There he is. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I can see and hear you. Thank you so much for joining us again. There you are. <laughs> Pleasure. Uh, so, um, so we're going to focus on these four areas of pronunciation that need to be mastered by students if they're to be clear in their use of English. Uh, and uh, I'm going to put my singer hat on and try to create that connective tissue between how we achieve this and a singer's skill set. So the first thing we're told to focus on is the clarity of consonant sounds. Um, from experience, most um, EFL learners struggle with the concept of voice versus unvoiced sounds, all right? Generally, it takes the form of sounds being de-voiced. Um, but to go back to that, I'd like to explain what these two realities are. So I'm going to ask uh, Grzegor to hold an F sound for four seconds. Would you mind trying that for me? Fantastic. Good man. So what Grzegorz has done here is taken a breath in. The diaphragm has risen and generated airflow. And then Grzegorz created an occlusion with a mix of his teeth, um, tongue, and lips, some occlusion, which created a hissing sound. That is an unvoiced sound. And I like to refer it to uh, one layer of resistance to air in the delivery of that sound. Now, this balance between airflow and resistance is going to be changed as soon as we create a voiced sound. It'll require more support, an additional uh, diaphragmic support, for him to be able to generate this second sound, which is V, the equivalent of the unvoiced F. Um, and that will require him to add some support uh, from the diaphragm to be able to generate that sound. So, Grzegorz, I'd like for you to give us the four seconds on the F again. And mm -hmm. following that, if you could, when I click my finger, switch it to a V sound. So uh, it should sound a bit like this. <sighs> Try that. <sighs> Fantastic. So we've moved from an unvoiced sound to a voiced one. And to do so, we had to adjust the amount of airflow that we generate by engaging the diaphragm a bit further. So how does this manifest in, in the work that I do with, uh, with students? Well, um, I'd like to give you two techniques to prevent devoicing. Now, the techniques that I give today are to be used in the context of a classroom or, or in the specific context of trying to help a student uh, who struggle with um, a specific pattern or a specific sounds that are tricky for them, all right? They're not necessarily to be implemented in everyday life, in their everyday use of English, but they're more um, kind of creative activities to help us clarify elements of diction. I thought I'd make that clear. So if we need help with plosive sounds like Bs, Ds, and hard Gs, I suggest we get the voice moving first using hummings. So we'll use M sounds before Bs, N sounds before Ds and the ing sound ing, as in bring, before words that start with a hard G. So 
Uh, Grzegorz, why don't you give us these three words preceded by these hummings? Why don't you try that for me? Okay. Mm, Bombay. Fantastic. Carry on. Mm, Denver. Mm, Glasgow. Fantastic. So by using a humming sound, we get the voice moving and we then release the plosive sound in a voiced way. So it doesn't sound like Pompeii. Should, no one sound like that. Uh, Tenver or Glasgow, right? Uh, they suddenly sound B's, D's, and G's. For fricative sounds, it's even easier because fricative sounds can be sustained over time. So you can actually sing on a fricative sound and strengthen that diaphragmic connection throughout. So, uh, Grzegorz, we're going to sing happy birthday together. Uh, I'm going to do the first line. You do the second. <coughs> and the third, you do the last. But we're going to do it on a V sound again, all right? So I go... <laughs> Your turn. <laughs> ah, come on. We even had a ritardando at the end to finish uh, in a grandiose way. Fantastic. Thank you so much, mate. Um, by the way, for those of you teachers who struggle sometimes with vocal reliability uh, in the classroom, people that are working with masks on all the time at the moment, this is a good exercise to, to strengthen the connection between the diaphragm and the voice to warm up your instrument ahead of a long day of teaching. So perhaps a tool that you can even use for yourself as a way of building a healthy relationship to your own instrument. Now, this uh, set of exercise comes from the singing world. Um, in singing, sometimes we sing in languages that are easy to sing because they're mostly driven by vowels. Italian is like that, Spanish is like that, Latin is like that. But we also have language that are a bit trickier as far as the vowel to consonant ratio is concerned. Um, an example of this is uh, German. Uh, German has a lot of consonants and we're taught, as part of our training as opera singers, we're taught to use these consonant sounds as friends rather than enemies. To, so to use them as a way of reinstating our anchoring and our support in our own instrument. So what I've done is I've taken this uh, short section of Siegmund's love song in uh, the opera Die Valkyre, and I've highlighted for you the, the key consonant sounds a performer might use to strengthen this connection with their support as they sing this section of the aria, okay? Um, and I'm gonna sing it for you now. So here we go. Now, put your attention to these consonant sounds that I will lean on as I go. Winter stürme wischendem Wonnemut, in mildem Licht et leuchtet der Lenz. So I've leaned on every single consonant sound as a way of just generating a little bit more support throughout. The Wagnerian repertoire is notoriously difficult uh, because you're always faced with a huge orchestra uh, as you perform it as well. All right? Um, so let's have a look at the second area now of Jennifer Jenkins' Lingua Franca core. She talks about consonant clusters, doesn't she? What are those? Well, a cluster, it's a group of things, isn't it? And when consonant, uh, consonants are being in a cluster, they are present in groups where we don't have any vowels in between. And this is another problem for opera singers. I told you that we sing for big audiences with big orchestras, and clusters will be the first things that drop when we sing. So to energize those and to make them audible for a huge audience, we have a little trick. What we do is we add a vowel sound at the core of that cluster. Uh, and the vowel that we use for the German speakers around uh, uh, is the schwa sound, the unaccented uh that exists in German. So um, I've taken this excerpt from uh, Don Giovanni's uh, uh, recitative by Don Octavio, uh, and I've highlighted two words that feature consonant clusters. First of all, we have the verb creder, which means to believe, and then another verb, discoprire, which means to discover. Notice that in the first one we have a k and a r without any vowel in between, and the second one we have a s and a k without a vowel in between either. So. I'm going to sing this fragment now, and I'm going to turn creder into creder. 
Same thing for discoprire into discoprire. So I'm adding a scoprire instead. All right? Let's have that fragment. It goes a bit like this. Come mai credere te ciò di sinero del lito capace in cavaliere? Oh, di scoprire il vero ogni mezzo si cerchi. So I've added some vowel sounds at the core of that cluster to make sure that this cluster is now intelligible and understandable by everyone in the audience, okay? And this is something that you can use, um, provided that you use your own judgment. I mean, there are some of our students that already have this feature as a systemic problem. So use that with caution. I wouldn't advise you using this with Italian speakers, for example, because they already have a tendency to add a schwa sounds throughout their delivery. Um, so use it with caution and on a targeted approach with certain specific students and in the context of the classroom itself, all right? So this concept of adding a sound is interesting. Let's see how that translates to, um, to the everyday classroom. Let's say our student struggles with uh, the word moonlight. It's a closed form compound. And I could expect that student to pronounce this word moonlight instead of moonlight so the n would be dropped all right um so first of all we divide the word into two groups thus breaking the cluster why don't you read that for us uh, gregor moon light moon light fantastic then we introduce the schwa at the core of it and this is where it gets a little bit playful and creative let's try and go from uh moon light add the schwa at the core of it and go slowly, just so that we have an understanding of what is moving whilst we're speaking that, that schwa sound. So could I have moonlight, moonlight, try that. Moonlight, moonlight. Fantastic, and then accelerate a little bit. Moonlight, moonlight. Moonlight, moonlight. And now we remove the schwa and restore the stress, moonlight. Moonlight. Fantastic. Moonlight. Lovely. Thank you so much. So by adding a sound, we have added or given ourselves a half second, a fraction of a second to notice and build awareness, physical awareness of how my apparatus moves from N to L. All right. Uh, and gradually we remove this crutch and we um, restore the word uh, to its formal glory. Does that make sense? Again, as I said before, please use that uh, with judgment. Some students, it might not be ideal for them to use that exercise, but it's a helpful one uh, when dealing with clusters, okay? So, lingua franca core's third area of focus is the length of vowel sounds. In English, we have short sounds and long sounds. It's an iconic feature of how English is delivered. Uh, it sounds iconically English when we can have really long, uh, uh, supported long sounds and really short sounds as well. And what I like to do in this context is to target these two sounds that are problematic, that we're getting entangled or confused, and I overlay them over a small rhythmic pattern of three, all right? Um, so you have one, two, three, one, two, three. What I'd like now is for Grzegorz to give me the short A sound of the word sit, all right? Um, so, and over the rhythm of three. So could I have A, 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 try that. A, A, A. Fantastic. Same rhythm and now with a long E as in the word seat. Can I have E, E, E? Try that. E, E, E. Fantastic. Um, that's great, but it's not good enough because we want to be good mu musicians. And in music, we have what we call dynamics. They're indications by the composer as to how a fragment should be either sung or played. And it so happens that we have dynamic markings in opera or in music that suggest extreme shortness and extreme length. Staccato for the short one, for the short one and tenuto for the long one. So now we're going to try and exaggerate. The word exaggerate is important here. Exaggerate the shortness of the first sound and exaggerate the length of the second one. So Gregor, could I have Super short. E, e, e. Fantastic. And now can I have e, 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 tenuto? E, e, e. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. And now let's try and and, and implement that into a, a short phrasal setting. So could I have, please sit down, try that. Please sit down. Fantastic. The sit was lovely and short. Great job, mate. And now let's have a, a similar version of that thought with two long sounds now. Can I have, please take a seed, try that. Please take a seed. Fantastic. And there we have it, folks. We have clear differentiation between short sounds and long sounds. And to do that, we've used rhythm and exaggeration that comes from a musical approach to dynamics, okay? Um, I hope that's helpful to people. Let's have a look at our last area of focus, um, which are stresses, intonation. What do we do when we stress a syllable? Um, well, we make it higher in pitch and we make it louder in volume. Oh, look at that. Pitch and volume, two other musical concepts here. Um, so, Grzegorz, could you give me the sample phrase at the bottom of the slide, um, making the syllables in red louder in volume and higher in pitch? Try that for me. My family is laughing at me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're doing fantastic work. Round of applause, everyone, for Grzegorz first. All right, so here it goes. I yeah. suspect... She will be keen to come to the performance. Fantastic. We have clear stress patterns now, and that allows us to really get the semantic meaning of that phrase. Um, a creative way for you guys to implement this with your clients, students, is to use a poetic form that's very uh, commonly used or very well known, rather, in the British Isles. And that is the form of the limerick. I don't know if some of you are familiar with what limericks are, but limericks are at the meeting point of music and language, okay? They're short poetic forms that have what I call a mandatory stress structure, okay? By that, I mean that you have to obey a, a, a stress pattern that is consistent with every single limerick that it has ever existed. Okay, and that structure goes as follows. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, one, two, one, two, three. All right. So now I'm going to ask Grzegorz to give us well. the limerick that's present here. Um, following this mandatory stress structure and by highlighting those stresses with your voice. Off you go, mate. The limerick packs loves anatomical into space that is quite economical but the good ones i've seen so seldom are clean and the clean ones so seldom are comical fantastic now we have a musical structure that that kind of is at the meeting ground of language and we use it as a way of leveraging clarity around stresses um if you are working on limericks with uh, beginners you can provide them <coughs> with the stresses if you're working with more advanced students, a good exercise is to get them to figure out where those stresses, stresses lie before they practice performing it. For advanced students, you can also work on trying to get them to musicalize this fragment, uh, either by whispering it, uh, by having some people just do the stresses and all the other people just uh, uh, mumbling at a lower pace or at a lower volume. You can be creative in your use of a, a, a material like this uh, and by trying to musicalize it, okay? All right, so we've covered Jennifer Jenkins' four areas of clarity, uh, but I'd like to add a fifth one, and that's one that's very dear to my heart as a performer, and uh, that is the concern of creativity and interpretation in language. Um, even in my beginners, uh, students and clients, I try to generate a sense of freedom around language that allows them to, to be creative in their exploration of English so that they don't feel that they're corseted into a structure. They can completely be creative in, in their learning and uh, work on interpreting English in their own way as early as possible. And how do I do that? Well, I encourage them to vary the speed of delivery to think of silence as something that is important in language. Um, perhaps use consonants in an expressive way, what I call word painting. Can they find keywords that they should highlight vocally so that the uh, semantic meaning of an idea is more present or more vibrant? And finally, I'll get them to use emotion, to fill stresses with emotion and subtext so that we can layer their delivery of language in a way that's more compelling, all right? So 
Um, I'll try and give you uh, an example. And to do that, I'll try and break the rule of a lifetime, which is um, I'll try and be boring for a second. Um, I'm going to sing a section of this aria by uh, Giuseppe Verdi from uh, the opera Rigoletto. It's called La Donna e Mobile. It's very famous and very well known. I'm going to sing the first half, so the left section on your slide. And I'm going to do exactly what's on the page, but I'm going to try and switch off my interpreter's brain and just do what's on the page, all right? Have a listen. La donna è mobile, qual più malvento, muta da cento e di pensiero. It's not bad, is it? But it doesn't have the character and the vibrancy of what I'm after if I'm to perform the Duke of Mantua, uh, who's a bit of a Lothario character. He's a Casanova. He's like a Don Giovanni. Uh, he's got this gusto and this life energy that is always ready to burst out. So I can't sing this fragment in a boring way anymore. I'm going to give you the whole fragment now, and I'm going to try and infuse some of these creative tools that I've mentioned. Keywords, dynamics, uh, talk about silences, perhaps uh, infuse emotion in my delivery of that uh, section of the aria. Okay? Shall That's I do it now? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? Shall I do it now? <laughs> you want to try it? Let's keep it for the end. Not for a million dollars. Okay. okay. All right. So let's have a second version of that. Okay. <laughs> La donna è mobile, qual più mal vento, muta da cento e di pensiero. Sempre un amabile, leggiadro viso, in pianto in riso e menzognero. La donna è mobile, qual più mal vento, muta da cento. And you might hear my dog reacting on the other side of the door over there. <laughs> um, but basically, this is how a performer works. We integrate the score, and then we overlay our own interpretation by coloring the voice in such a way that we make this character compelling through our voice. All right? So I was going to suggest that Grzegorz does the exact same thing, um, but I'm going to ask him to do... No problem at all. At this version stage. Of this, <laughs> a version of this using a short text. Um, so I've provided him with a text from uh, the book Real Food by a great food writer, a British food writer called Nigel Slater. Um, uh, and he, there's a section of the book where he talks about very humble ingredients, and garlic is one of them. So what I've done is I've provided uh, Grzegorz with the fragment, and also I've given him some hints as to sections uh, or certain um, vowels or consonant sounds he might use as a way or as targets for expression, uh, for the conveying of his own interpretation on this text. So I'm going to let Grzegorz give us a version of this text, um, <laughs> interpretatively, interpretatively performed. Let's try that. Okay. Running out of garlic would be as unthinkable as running out of salt, pepper, of olive oil. I love the taste of a roasted. It emerges from the oven as sticky golden nuggets, sweet, mellow, and as soft as butter. A whole head of summer garlic split through the center, drizzled with everyday olive oil and scattered with thyme leaves, takes on an especially mild sweetness, sweet enough to spread on toast. Come on, how good was that, right? By using consonant sounds expressively, by allowing himself to uh, vary his delivery and create what I call geography and language, he's found his way to make this text come to life make it more vibrant, make it more interesting to all of us. And I would put it to you that this is a skill set that is accessible to our students and that it's worth triggering this musical approach to language uh, in, a, in a way that our students can embody it and embrace it as well. Um, so there you have it, folks. We've covered uh, over this talk quite a lot of content. You'll notice as well that we've followed in some way Leonard Bernstein's progression. We've had a look at phonetics. 
very specifically. We had a look at syntactic element. And finally, fi uh, finally, actually, we've tried to work on semantics, on how enunciation and pronunciation is connected with the delivery of ideas, of thoughts, of complex um, concepts. Um, so I think what I'll do is I'll yield the balance of my time for question. Uh, I'd just like to finish uh, by um, giving you my contact details. Um, so my understanding is that these slides will be made available through Macmillan. So don't, don't email me with requests for slides. I think they'll be made available uh, available to you through Macmillan. But if you have any other questions, uh, you're interested in my approach and my work, feel free to write to me. I've uh, given my uh, personal email address here. Uh, you also have uh, my uh, social media taglines and my website um, that I use to, to, to work with clients and so on. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for your time and I'll be ready to take some questions now. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. How did you like it, you guys? <laughs> I had a great time. I mean, how about that for a festival session? <laughs> oh, that was fun. <laughs> OK, um, a, a quick a question uh, yeah. to do with you again as a professional. Uh, how many, we, we know that you sing in several different languages. Do you actually speak all of those languages as well? This was a question from several people. Um, so uh, my mother tongue is French. Uh, so I've sung in French and in English, of course. I sing in Italian and in German, two language um, in which I have, uh, of which I have some element of control. So I can get out in a city in Italian and in German as well. Um, because they're languages that are so commonly used in opera, we need to get to know the grammar and the vocabulary. The problem is that, you know, we tend to learn 19th century German. And so you can't really, you know, ask for a sausage in a pub uh, using Eichendorf or Heine. Uh, you might sound a bit silly. Uh, so there's a discrepancy between the sort of German that I learn and, and the uh, practical use in the modern world. But I do speak a bit of German and Italian as well. Well, you, you can probably do Wagnerian German, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, uh, with with, uh, with retinue, with with some some element of uh, control around it. Yes. Okay, so that's one Other question questions that we got. I've just ticked. Um, uh, perhaps uh, since since uh, the slide uh, 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 with your course on is now uh, um, visible, uh, a question that somebody asked along the way. If one were to actually, uh, uh, you know, undertake uh, a program like yours, how mm -hmm. long would that take? What What is the time frame where you'd say you would take somebody from a certain, you know, not so satisfactory yeah. level into something a lot more uh, what the, the learner would like it, to have? It depends on a. It depends on a lot of factors. Uh, so it's it's all down to having a good initial conversation and us, you know. Uh, establishing a course of tuition. I like to say that within six to 12 sessions with someone, I, I can in, create some meaningful changes in, in how they use- Six to 12, you said, right? Six 12, to 12, yeah. But for some people it's less, for some people it's more. Uh, it's It really depends. I have some people that have stayed for, for four or that are, are just coming uh, for top-ups once in a while before presentations, for example. On the other side, I have people that have been with me for, for, for months and months uh, where we, you know, we address the issues that are more pressing first, and then we dive into language uh, uh, in a more creative way. There's some people that reach out to me that want to have conversations about everything. Um, and I use a mix of phonetic exercises, uh, phrasal settings, and conversation and reading exercises, um, because, hey, the use that we're after here is in conversational English for the business world, for, uh, for their personal lives. So a lot of the work I do is, conversational in some way where I pinpoint certain um, patterns that are coming um, coming around regularly and that we try to kind of address and to kind of control over time, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, right. Now, um, another one, which I think is really interesting. Um, one person uh, commented sort of, you know, with a question mark at the end. So would you say that uh, just imitating and repeating is enough or uh, is something else needed in order for the learner to cross that threshold uh, into more confident pronunciation? 
I mean, imitation is a good start. It's a good place to start. Um, I'm always very, um, very much in support of a student's radar to be out there. Listening is an important skill in this landscape as well. And yes, inspiring yourself from, from the sources of English that are meaningful to you around you is super helpful. Um, but my goal is that, and as I mentioned in the talk, diction is one of the tools that we use for clarity of communication. And, and, and the idea is to, to fuse the work that we do in phonetics and in pronunciation with all the other English skill sets that are being received okay. uh, with tuition. Um, but yes, imitation is a good place to start. Why not? The more you experiment with that landscape and the more that is connected with a meaningful transition to, to being a, a confident and clear user of English, that's really what we're after. And if imitation and repetition is a means to that, yes. Um, I would be cautious with repetition though. Um, very often if I have someone that focuses on a word, for example, seed, 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 and they focus too much on that sound, it's as if you're trying to plant a peg in space. It doesn't make any sense. I always like to work in triads, so try and find words that are problematic. Um, um, sit, sitting, seat, so that you have a, a, a triangular approach to, to sounds, so that you yeah. don't hammer away at one sound, you actually put it in a system of three so that you allow distinction and differentiation to take place. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, a, a, a more technical uh, a question, perhaps uh, one about the, the sound schwa, which is problematic uh, uh, to some you know, speakers, to some other ones, yeah. and uh, another about th and the th and the the uh, and, and the, you know before you answer, I recall from uh, Jennifer Jenkins's uh, research on the lingua franca core that these two just happen not to be part of the lingua franca core. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Um, the schwa sound um, or vowel modification on syllables that are generally off the stress, um, I use, I, I introduce that a bit later in the process. Um, same with the iconic uh, TH in English, um, because the, uh, the normal English ear is used to recognize this. Uh, for example, the, the the pattern of a French speaker pronouncing an S or, Z, or, or a Z instead of a TH, we're used to recognizing that as a TH. So for me, these are not patterns that uh, are in my, um, you know, must be addressed immediately. They oh. they consist of cosmetic patterns that can be addressed over time. Um, but to me, they're not instrumental to immediate intelligibility. Does that make sense? I like to think of my patterns in two categories patterns that affect clarity, that get in the way of me understanding you. And the second one, I call them cosmetic patterns that do not affect clarity of communication, but that suggest that English is perhaps a second language for you, all right? Okay. Uh, somebody just uh, suggested that I challenge you with Aha. a Polish tongue twister, but... <laughs> They will be surprised, will they not? Because I already know what you can do. So can you just show them <laughs> since they asked? <laughs> yeah, so um, I, in so you should know that there's a lot of Polish opera singers out there, fantastic artists, uh, a mix of Italian sounds and Slavic mindset, and it's, it's great <laughs> uh, for opera. Uh, and um, I, I get to be friends with a lot of them and, you know, post-performance uh, at the pub, we have a drink together and then we have a look at tongue twisters. Um, so I've learned one Polish tongue twister. I hope I do this right. But I think it goes like this. Is that right? Now, what do you say to that? <laughs> Polish people <laughs> in the audience. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay, we, we still have one or two minutes. So perhaps you know one thing which is more general in 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 range and very interesting is um, those breath control uh, exercises, which of course are also important for teachers as professionals. Uh, uh -huh. Would you have maybe one or two favorites that you could recommend to us as something yeah. we could? Do? Yeah. So. Um we, the first one is um, something that we've covered today, but in a different uh, setting, and, and it's the use of humming. 
as a way of warming up your voice before a long day of teaching, for example. Um, and what I like to do is to get you to find a point of humming and to try and bring the sound so that it feels like it resonates behind your eyes and nose. We call that the mask in music. And if you can, try and think of moving flexibly from a soft version of that N to a loud version of that N and back to a soft one. I'll give you an example of this. It should sound a bit like this. So we go from soft to loud and back to soft. That's a great way of finding flexibility and phonation and also placing the resonance in the right zone. OK, uh, so that's a good exercise. The second one is to do what we've done for happy birthday. Sing on a voice fricative as a way of connecting your diaphragm with uh, phonation. Um, so it doesn't have to be happy birthday. You can also do it on simple accents or simple um, uh, stress patterns. For example, this is a technique that's called accent method. It has nothing to do with having an accent, but it refers to um, the rhythmic patterns that we use to, to create diaphragmic support and connection with uh, phonation, with the generation of sounds, okay? Uh, so that's another um, exercise that I would recommend. If you do these two quite regularly, one or two minutes a day in the morning as a way of warming up. You can do it in the train and car. Um, it's great. It gets your voice to be uh, warmed up and ready for the day, especially if you're teaching and wearing a mask at the same time. All right. Uh, I think we need to be wrapping this up, but uh, I cannot let you go without uh, articulating one final request, which is could we perhaps have yet another little, little, uh, song before we say goodbye. Yes, for sure. <laughs> so um, I, I'm not in the UK at the moment. I'm in Montreal in Canada, which, which is where my family is from. Um, and um, it's very sunny out there today. So I thought um, that I'd sing a song that you probably all know, uh, which is O Sole Mio. So I'll give you a little section of that. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Che bella cosa n'aiurna te sole n'aria serena dopo la tempesta per l'aria fresca parreggiana fresca che bella cosa n'aiurna te sole Manna to sole, chi o bello e me, o sole mio, sta in fronte a te, o sole, o sole mio, sta in fronte a te. There you go. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, shall we call this a, a true festival then? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's no better way to close with a bit of music and singing. Oh, bravo. On the all right. All of us. Uh, this was absolutely stunning. <laughs> what a treat. Thank you well, so much. My, my real pleasure, and thank you so much for putting this event on. It's just, uh, it's wonderful to see all the teachers out there, uh, whether they're in language or in other areas. Um, uh, and it's, it's wonderful to see that our community is sticking together despite the circumstances we find ourselves in at the moment.